to our 2023 year and is our first lecture for the Military History Society of New South Wales. My name is Rob Musket. I've just been elected uh, as president, so I do welcome you all here. I do understand that we might have members of the Civil War Round Table, so we do welcome you. This is our first and ever joint venture with a like-minded um, institution. So we're going to try and do more of this. So I do thank Ian. Ian is the president of the Civil War Round Table. So we had a good chat last year. Um, we, uh, we, we went into this with a very open mind and I do appreciate your support too. Ian will present to us the siege of Petersburg in 1864-65. Uh, Ian is a semi-retired civil engineer who was a planning engineer, project engineer and project manager on heavy multidisciplinary projects for major construction construction company for over 30 years. Uh, principal of one main construction consultancy. Uh, during his retirement, obviously he's had, uh, had the uh, time to explore more into military history and obviously taking out the role as president of the Civil War Round Table. So without any further ado, I try ask you to welcome me to the podium. Thank you, Rob. That was only partly true. My kids refer to me as a failed retiree. <laughs> Um, the Civil War Round Table uh, is a quirky group, about 50 people, not as large as your organisation. We have a fairly significant cross membership people who belong to both organisations. And uh, we meet six times a year, um, a bit less than this one. But, uh, we would welcome any uh, people who find the Civil War interesting to uh, come along. I'm going to talk today about the siege of Petersburg, so called, uh, well, really a siege, that's the common name, but it was never surrounded and reinforcements were able to come and go. So, um, it Occupied a fairly long period of time, nine months about, out of a four year conflict of the American Civil War. But let me let me give you some background. The American Civil War, the Union, the Northern States. Fought for some of the states, uh, Confederacy, after the Confederacy succeeded and uh, formed its, what they would say was their own country. Even the term uh, American Civil War is objectionable to people from the southern states. <laughs> they tend to refer to the war between the states. The reason they find it objectionable is because it implies that they were not a separate country. Of course, that's even today, uh, they have been, still have that argument. But the numbers are phenomenal. A little bit hazy. Look, the plus or minus 10,000 usually uh, for the size of the armies and for the number of people. But the generally accepted figure for the number of dead were both sides was 600. Out of a population that was measured by a census in 1860 at 33 million. That included 3 million slaves in the southern states. The, um, there are approximately one in four of the Confederate men military age dead at the end of the war. Um, compare that with the Australian context, we tend to think of the First World War as fairly uh, serious conflagration in our society. 
And uh, as I've said, the population of Australia at that time was slightly less than five million. And the accepted number of Australian dead was 62,000. If you do the comparison, that's quite a lot less than the rate of um, deaths admittedly from both sides in uh, the American Civil War. So even today, the American Civil War is a scar on the American history. And it, it's having a terrible uh, effect on the American society. Uh, the Northerners pretty much outnumbered the Southerners two to one in the army. Excited about the numbers, plus 10,000 or minus 10,000, the message is still the same, the conclusion is still the same. Uh, I, I don't worry too much about the accuracy. Not, this campaign of um, Petersburg from uh, June of 1864 to April of 1865 does not figure in the list of major battles. Did not have anything like the casualties of some of the other battles. By far and away, the biggest battle uh, in the Civil War was given to the Navy system. Um, and uh, I, those links at the bottom were, are there because I'm going to do it here, but uh, uh, they're there to demonstrate that um, there were many, many more serious outcomes in terms of casualties than Petersburg. But none more serious in terms of outcome, in terms of political effect and the resulting consequence than Petersburg. You can see there that the war really did split the state. The uh, orange ones, so-called loyal, loyal slave states, they're the states which did not join the Confederacy, but a lot of the people did. And so when you hear about brothers going one direction and then the other, fighting each other, that was common enough in those borderline states. Uh, some of the states, the deep southern states, those green ones, they actually formed together before um, the uh, new president was sworn in. They, as soon as there was an election in Hill, they said they wanted to become their own country. And uh, the northerners said, no, you can't. disaster of the Civil War. So we had the uh, North and the South quite separate. There was still a lot of things happening in 1864. Uh, we're going to focus on what was happening around Richmond. Richmond in Virginia, about 100 kilometres from Washington DC, became the capital of the Confederacy. But Richmond was about, you know, it's one of the last states to actually join the Confederacy. And uh, other, th other major things that were happening at the same time, for example, Sherman was attacking Atlanta and then marching to the sea, uh, capturing Savannah, marching north to join up with the forces that, the Union forces that were active in the uh, area of Richmond. Now, zeroing in on this, there's commonly referred to as the Overland Campaign. And you can 
see there, in a period of about five weeks, no more than five weeks, there were a series of major battles, wilderness, Spotsylvania, Cold Harbor in particular was a disaster for them all. Uh, but every time, instead of what they'd previously done, of going back and licking their wounds, they attempted to outflank the southern forces by moving to the, the right flank of uh, the Confederate forces. And uh, there you can see a series of movements. So the Union Army, huge army, defeated several times in this period, responded to defeats by outflanking uh, or attempting to outflank the, the Confederacy. And then uh, in stark contrast to that uh, pretty much an open war of movement they ended up getting embroiled in what became nine months long so-called siege uh, of the uh, town of Petersburg, which was a railway town, the second largest in Virginia, about 25 miles from the Virginian capital, not far. And uh, it's, it's true that uh, Virginia without uh, Petersburg could not survive. Who was there? Well, this fellow, Ulysses Grant, later on president of the US, a bloody no hope of before the war, uh, quite frankly, but he uh, rose to the top, had been quite successful in Cincinnati and uh, that other front. And he was transferred across to the Eastern Front. And uh, he, he took over. Opposite him, this fellow, Robert E. Lee, uh, <coughs> gracious gentleman. And uh, he had been running the uh, Shadow for the <coughs> purposes for uh, not all the time, but from reasonably early. The opposing forces. Well, prior to the 15th of June, 1864, it's not that the Union had, didn't have an army in the vicinity. They had General Butler there with the army of the James. The James is the river that, uh, that gave itself to that, um, that army. General Butler was a political appointment. Uh, he'd been down in New Orleans and served up some trouble there and uh, managed to get himself, it's a little bit of a mystery as to how, um, to command this uh, army of the James, but he was useless, ineffective. And uh, so, he had been under instructions to attack Petersburg. And he'd been there to do it. But not much happened. The Confederacy, in the three years prior to June 1864, had built up their defences of uh, Petersburg. They had 55 artillery battle, uh, batteries and connected infantry earthworks that form a 10 mile arc around the city. Now, that's around Petersburg. There was also defences going right up to the north of the of Richmond. And so the total line ended up being about 35 miles. After the disastrous outcome for the Union at uh, Cold Harbour. Really was a defeat. They almost surprised General Lee by 
turning up after having crossed the James River, building a uh, long um, pontoon bridge and getting an enormous army over the, the river uh, and again trying to outflank the Confederacy. They almost beat General Lee um, to the defences of the Petersburg. So, 15th to 18th of June, there are initially not many Confederate troops there. Uh, there, there was a, a guard under General Bogart. Um, you know, as you can see there, 2,200 troops over a three mile front. And uh, uh, Grant arrived on the 18th of June with 62,000 people. And just in the nick of time, uh, Lee got there with his 42,000 strong army. By February of 1865 and in April, the Confederates had about 45,000. By the end, Lee was losing about 100 men a day, a day to the desertion. Uh, his army was crumbling away from him. And um, the Union had built up their forces to generally quite a bit, say 110,000. Think about that. And those numbers, that's an awful lot of food each day. An awful lot of uh, arms. sustainment of those uh, numbers of men was really quite a problem and I'll come back to that in a moment. Thank you John for photographs from when we were there in 2016. Like a lot of these battlefields, the National Park Service has uh, done a rather good job of preserving them. They look rather idyllic and I imagine they weren't idyllic at the time. <laughs> But uh, it, 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 it's a lot of John's photos are uh, ones that I took out of the collection because uh, they were ga cannons on uh, nice grassy ground. <laughs> but um, this is actually what it was like in 2016, and this is what it was like in 1860. They had photography, but they didn't have action photography. The photographs had to be given a very long exposure time. And so they've got landscapes, they've got certain types of photographs, but not of people in action. <coughs> you can see that the fortifications were quite well developed. And that's obviously a posed photograph because uh, photography at the time required a long exposure. But there were large camps in the area established uh, to house all the 110,000 Union soldiers and uh, 40 odd thousand So on the 14th of June in 1864, federal troops began crossing this pontoon bridge over the James River. It was about the length that you see there, 640 metres. And on the 15th of June, federal troops attacked the Petersburg fortifications. But they did it very hesitantly. Admittedly, the troops were tired and um, had come a long way. But their initial attack late in the day uh, against what was really only lightly held fortifications uh, 
actually captured a couple of kilometers of, oh, a couple of, yeah, a couple of kilometers of uh, the breastworks, the uh, fortification. 16 of the defending guns, and there wasn't much opposition. Then they stopped. And that was definitely a missed opportunity. And uh, it was in that interval that uh, Lee turned up with his uh, 40 odd thousand uh, seasoned troops. Now, to overcome this photography problem of not being able to have action shots, they had sketches in the field. And this guy, Frank Leslie, had uh, started um, a whole bunch of uh, sketches. And they produced drawings like this instead of photographs. Uh, and so, it was a ministry right throughout the Civil War, um, published in a journal in New York. And that is a representation of that attack on the 15th of June, 1864. It really doesn't matter much. You can't tell anything from these uh, um, sketches, but they tried. The next two days, 16th and 17th of June, there were more missed opportunities. And on the 18th of June, by then, there were enough Federals that had gone across the river that 70,000 of them attacked only to discover that the uh, trenches had been located overnight. You can get an idea of the frustration of some of the Union generals of uh, the, the missed opportunities. If you don't mind, I'll read this out. A vigorous assault on the enemy's works will be made tomorrow. Now this is at 11 p.m. on the 17th of June. So it's for the 18th. And uh, by the whole force of the 5th, 9th and 2nd Corps, Corps commanders will make all needful arrangements in time to have the assault simultaneous and are directed to make it in strongholds well supported. Now, I won't read the rest, but they were planning uh, this uh, action on the 18th. Here's a message to General Meade. He was the commander of the Army of the Potomac, uh, which um, were the troops that had come across the James River. And, uh, on the bridge. I've had my whole line close enough to the enemy to assault since 1.15 p.m. I thought the attack at 12 midday was to be a rush. And uh, it goes on. And then General Meade responds. Only 20 minutes later. I'm greatly astonished at your dispatch of 2 p.m. What additional orders to attack you require, I cannot imagine. <laughs> My orders have been explicit and are now repeated. That you each immediately assault the enemy with all your force, and if there is any further delay, the responsibility and the consequences will rest with you. It was a deal of frustration. They did attack, uh, not effectively, and um, then settled into trench warfare. Now, there were nine separate recognised assaults made on the Confederate trenches in the period from middle of June to the beginning of April. But the one of the most famous of them is the crater and of course I'm a civil engineer and I've done a few tunnels and I'm a bit interested in this uh, from a personal point of view. But one of the uh, 
union regiments was a regiment of Pennsylvania coal miners. And these Pennsylvania coal miners suggested to their officers that they could basically do what happened at Hill 60 in 1916. Um, and uh, they said if we could get under that uh, entrenchment, we could blow it up. And they did. The idea was laughed at by the engineering corps and by other troops. So they just went, they were given the permission to go ahead and uh, they started 24th of June and within about five weeks they completed the exercise. They built a tunnel of a bit over 500 feet, 156 metres. Uh, two transverse galleries at the end of it and they put four tons of explosive in those galleries. They were not supported with, uh, by the uh, engineering corps um, so they had to find the explosive otherwise. Um, I was intrigued that they built a ventilation shaft sort of hidden from the Confederate lines, but um, not at the end of the tunnel. And they had a timber plume to the face, carrying fresh air, and they got that to flow by having a fire continually at the base of this ventilation tunnel. And so in that fairly simple way, managed to get a flow of fresh air to the base and then of course it flows back through the tunnel and up the ventilation shaft. They exploded it. The Confederate troops were utterly surprised. They didn't realise it was happening. And they ended up with a hole Meters, about 50 meters across. And uh, all of the southern troops within a couple of hundred yards fled. They were surprised when they fled. But then they came back. The Union attacking force had been changed at the last minute. Uh, the, the force that had been rehearsed in what to do about this crater was told they weren't attacking and uh, a different force that was not rehearsed and didn't, hadn't really prepared for it. The main difference was that the troops that were um, rehearsed for the exercise in the Black Regiment and this would have been just about the first time that the Black Regiment was, uh, the regiments were uh, in battle. And the one that was put in their place was white. And uh, instead of going around the crater, the troops went into it. They were trapped. And uh, the Confederates got, their, Confederates got their wits about them, came back and shot into the crater and it ended up being pretty much a disaster of union casualties. Missed opportunity. And of course that crater is one of the most famous battles of the uh, whole period and um, it also got the uh, sketch treatment in the journals of the day. Lots of treatment. Things went on. That, that occurred in July of 1864. And um, it then settled into uh, pretty much trench warfare for the rest of 1864 and the beginning of 1865. 
Um, the Union forces continually tried to move to the west to outflank the Confederates and to cut off their railway supply lines. They had um, Trittenberg was well served with railways. Uh, there were two heading into the Confederate land, one heading to uh, uh, Richmond, one heading to City Point, which is actually the port area that the Union was using. It was the Union headquarters, and it was uh, they developed it as uh, their supply center. And I understand that they um, uh, also built uh, more of it so that they could supply uh, their troops along their um, front line. So the Confederate lines ended up stretching over 56 kilometres from east of Richmond to southwest of Petersburg. The Union was trying to stretch them because the Union was able to um, pretty much uh, call all reinforcements and by now Lee wasn't. If he lost men, he lost men. He wasn't really able to replace them. And so in February 1865, Grant again got in his troops to move further west. And uh, then there were I read yesterday um, about the Battle of uh, Five Forks, which occurred on the 1st of April, but there had been a lot of other battles just in the couple of days before that. It's a bit too complicated and chaotic to try to explain. But um, uh, there have been a lot of battles at the end of March in the, at the western end of the line. And this culminated in uh, the 1st of April Battle of Five Forks. Uh, I just will note that the Union Regiment on the left hand of the end of their line was a cavalry regiment commanded by one George Custer. It's the very same fellow who uh, was later uh, infamous uh, of um, Little Bighorn. And um, it really was an overwhelming of numbers. Uh, about the, the casualties by Civil War standards were not huge. Uh, they had about 800 Confederate casualties and slightly less Union casualties. About 5,000 prisoners, uh, which was disastrous because. Uh, the Confederates couldn't replace them. And so Lee withdrew his forces and abandoned the capital of Richmond. He moved west. His horses were so weak they could they couldn't really pull the, the wagons. And so he got to a place uh, called Appomattox Courthouse. And uh, I have some photographs of it. I've actually got the building in which the surrender was signed and the desk at which it was signed. Uh, and uh, about a week after the Battle of Five Forks, uh, Lee surrendered. That was not the end of the war, uh, but effectively it was. It went on until. Uh, sometime in June, uh, when the uh, last Confederate unit surrendered. But uh, the uh, loss of Lee's army were, and the loss of the capital was really the end of the Confederate enterprise. Logistics was a big thing. To have that number of troops just around Richmond and Petersburg. They used the railways. The Confederacy was down to one railway in the end, but 
we've always had a good supply, a good railway to Richmond, and, uh, and the um, uh, Union Army, through its um, supply bases they built at City Point, which was also the headquarters of Grant, uh, had an effective expanded port there and uh, a good railway that they had built along the front lines to supply the troops. They couldn't hold Richmond. Once Petersburg was lost, they abandoned Richmond. Now, you can't see the detail on that. I haven't tried, but it is a battle on that of uh, five forts. And uh, there, there, are, there are a lot of people involved. There are, there are many um, divisions, and uh, um, uh, quite a bit of uh, movement and uh, so on. Uh, one general got sacked in the middle of it. Probably, probably wrongly, I think he was found to be have been wrong and sacked. And uh, it was a fairly large affair. The upshot for the whole period came to June to the 2nd of April. There were nine major assaults, resulting in 42,000 Union casualties and 28,000. Now I've got a few photographs that might interest you that were current as of 2016. John's got an enormous number of photographs of Ken, I just included this one, <laughs> saved you from them. Uh, but you can see that they had fairly well developed defences. Um, they'd been kept, looked after by the National Park Service. And this is at, at Appomattox Courthouse. Uh, it's the, the desk at which the surrender was signed. There's an interesting little side story about this too. The guy who owned this house in Appomattox Courthouse, his previous house, he abandoned because it was on the Bull Run battlefield. And Bull Run was the first major battle and then they had another go there uh, next year. Well, he moved with his family to Appomattox and uh, to blow me down if it wasn't the site of the surrender. And there's the house. Uh, quite a nice little house. Initially, you stated they had 55 batteries of artillery, but 2,200 men. Of the 2,200 men, how many were gunners manning the guns and how many were available for other military tasks? Uh, I'm not specific about that, but you get the impression there must have been uh, not many infantry men. Yeah. General Beauregard, who had previously taken a rather leading role in the war, in fact, he, he was the guy in charge at Fort Sumner, wasn't he? Uh, the, the attack on the he guns. He fired the guns. He fired the guns at Fort Sumner and it started the whole thing off in 1861. And um, he uh, had been put there pretty much as a, a quiet retirement, uh, not a major front. And so uh, he didn't have a great number of men there. And uh, it 
wasn't really until we arrived with these 40 odd thousand that they had a serious um, uh, defence uh, possible. So the Union Army really could have taken it on that first night. If they kept going, they would have been able to take it. They did not know, apparently, that the Confederate lines were so sparsely held and uh, didn't recognise the advantage they had. They had. It's a statement more than a question. Um, Grant was in charge of the United States Army. Meade was in charge of the Army of the Potomac. Yep. And it seems their headquarters were that close together that in the end Meade got sick and tired of being told what to do, so he just sat there and let Grant rattle on. But in military terms, Meade was in charge of the Army of the Potomac, which attacked St. Petersburg. Yeah, that, that's true. Uh, he reported to Grant. So uh, there were a couple of other armies too at the same mm -hmm. time. There was uh, a cavalry force that had been sent up to the Shenandoah Valley to um, deal with the Confederates who'd gone up there. Earlier in the war, Samuel Jackson, so-called, had uh, uh, had a rather successful campaign in the Shenandoah Valley. Um, and that had drawn away quite a large number of new troops from this uh, James River area. And uh, they wanted to do the same thing again. Um, so there was a separate army that the Union Army had, uh, in addition to Meade's army, and in addition to Butler's army, uh, that uh, was for a while up in the Shenandoah Valley, but it was that army which, together with me, but it was that army which uh, was involved in the Five Forks battle. The, the other thing I enjoy is in the American army, you went from colonel to brigadier, and then depending on who you knew, what you knew, you would become a one star, a two star general. Yeah. In the Confederate army, you got to a brigadier, then you had to prove yourself to get two stars. Mm -hmm. And this is why when you look at some of these battles, the American two-star generals were useless because they had gotten there by who they knew, what they knew, and not necessarily how. You know, to, to, so when you look at Butler, yeah, yeah. he's definitely a case of point. He, he, yeah, yeah, he's <laughs> useless. <laughs> yeah. 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 Where that wouldn't have happened in the Confederate army because Lee made sure that all these two-star generals knew the hell what they were doing. Yeah. Uh, there's also a preponderance of major generals. Uh, you know, major generals reporting to major generals. And um, their armies were a bit different to what you might be used to in the sense that the generals did tend to lead from the front. And it was remarkable how many generals were in fact killed during the American Civil War uh, because of that. The way I read it, um, you didn't have to think to be a general. You were in charge of a division or in charge of a regiment. You got the orders from on high and you stood out front and went whack. There and didn't seem to be too much brain work as to how or where they would manoeuvre their regiments. There was, that, I agree with you, but uh, it, I think it was all a fairly amateur sort of uh, thing. And um, John and I have had this conversation many times. Quite a few times. Uh, that the only strategy and tactic that they knew was charge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the underlying problems was they had never caught up with the effect of the mini ball. Correct. Yeah. And the rifle musket. Yeah, yeah. that's true. Yeah. Uh, what, what that is is for about the, the mini ball makes an enormous difference. It's faster and it kills faster. Yeah. It expands into the barrel of the rifle, and when it's 
it's basically a dumb dumb bullet. Yeah. And it um, explodes when it hits. Uh, the other thing is, that you, I think you've got to remember too that West Point, which was the only, uh, at that stage, apart from uh, the VMI, uh, was the major military academy. And you look at the curriculum that they were being taught, mm -hmm. it was all Napoleonic. Yeah. So uh, even the great professor there, uh, Marne, who was the professor of West Point at the time, and these guys who were serving uh, at the higher ranks all went through in the 1830s, so were 1840s, so either veterans of the Mexican War. Um, if you look at the curriculum, uh, it was all based on the Pioneer War. So when they came out, uh, and the Civil War started, they obviously used the same <coughs> of strategy. The other aspect to this too, um, I'm just reading at the moment a uh, biography on Longstreet. Yes. Um, so he was probably the better of all the uh, core divisional commanders on both sides. And the reason why he was so successful, even though later on he was uh, smeared and, and by, the, by his own uh, uh, colleagues, um, he was the only one really working at an operational level. Most of the guys uh, who were leading were all at that brigade and, and using low, high, what we would call tactical, even out of the grade level, we were still using tactical uh, manoeuvring. Longstreet was successful because he was probably the only one, and some would argue that Grant had a similar um, a generalship, but he was working at an operational, what we now term an operational uh, level of manoeuvring. Armies. So we can say, yeah, it's, you know, they um, they did the wrong thing from our perspective. But I think if you look at where they're coming from and uh, what they were taught and what their experience in <coughs> warfare was, um, I don't blame them too much because again, they were still struggling with what they were taught. The tension between the curriculum at West Point and also their new technology, which they really had not seen before, repeating. Um, Springfield repeating rifles, which just came out in 63, 64, later in the war. Yeah, the cavalry had been. Yeah, and yeah, the Gatling gun and, and, and then the rifling of the artillery. Uh, all these aspects were happening at the same time. So you also it would have been quite, quite difficult. Too, so that's, you know, everyone would be struggling to get training, you know, up to an adequate level. Right. Yeah. Well, it's hard to be training when you're fighting at the same time. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. There's, there's one other thing that led to a lot of the problems that especially the Union Army had, and that is that they didn't use a cartering system to expand the army. They didn't like the expense that, for example, the Confederates did. Because, as you say, the generals and the regimental commanders too, for that matter, they were raised by the states and they were usually political appointees or they were political patronage. It also meant that then when they needed more troops, rather than just rebuilding veteran regiments, they raised new ones because they could have more than yeah, the yeah, general. Yeah. The South didn't do that. The South, or not to the same extent, they would rebuild their veteran regiments so that the newcomers could learn from the old hands. But the Union generally didn't, and that's one of the reasons why the Union regiments bled down to, you had regiments, for example, going into the wilderness, veteran regiments that probably only out of a thousand original men might have been lucky to have 250. Once they fell below 200, they were no longer entitled to have a full colonel as their commander. He converted to lieutenant colonel, which made him junior to the new guy who came and knew nothing. There was a vacancy for a brigade commander up he went. It was one of the worst systems of rebuilding and reinforcing an army that I can think of. And it was, um, and yet, as I said, the Confederates, by and large, got it right because they recognised the importance of having the amateurs and the newcomers learn from the professionals. Was that um, uh, an innovation, in inverted commas, on the Americans, or could they adopt to that and say, you know, like French or Prussian or British? Um, oh, can I have said yes? I mean, they just we don't have that. Command structure was largely based on captains or purchase. Yeah. I mean, so it wasn't that unusual. So that was the system. But it was, it was just interesting that the Confederates out of necessity because they had to basically build an army from scratch. So we also had several very good professional soldiers came into the Confederate Army, they did a reasonably good job. And it's one of the reasons why with inferior numbers, they often, you know, they really did. You, 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 they kicked the up, they kicked the Union's ass for a couple of years. Yeah. In the East, not so much in the West. In the West, 
So basically, Union generals by and large in the West, yeah. Grant, Sherman, and Thomas, and they would have turned to lead three, yeah. one more, but yeah. look at About 350 uh, officers resigned yeah. from the United States Army to go south and uh, yes, that's join right. the Confederate yeah. Army. And, and the, the, most of the, the, the better of the generals, or the uh, higher order officers, came from the south, mm -hmm. which yeah. is why they, they uh, initially did so much better. When you look at who was on, well, they, well, they basically they got um, amongst the, the five full generals who went to the um, went to the south, or the first full generals who were appointed in the south. You basically had the former quartermaster general um, Joe Johnson, who was the, the highest ranking general from the person who went to the south. You had Robert E. Lee, who was the hero of the Mexican War, he commanded uh, he was commandant of West Point, and he knew all of the knew all the commanders and had yeah. taught a lot of them, therefore understood what they were going to do. Yeah. Um, you know, you also had, well, a lot of people don't even realise the senior Confederate commander, Sam Cooper, and he had been, um, uh, I think, a, a, a staff officer, a brevet brigadier in the, um, in the War Department. Then you had Albert Sidney Johnson, who, of course, was um, a veteran and a hero of the Mexican War also. So, and, and, of course, he, he Beauregard, who was um, probably the best artilleryman in the US Army. So they had a pretty good leadership right from the start. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of people... On a different note... Let's try that one again in the evening. On a different note, West Point, between 1865 and 1914, taught that St. Petersburg was irrelevant to modern warfare mm. uh, and that... Uh, what was important in modern warfare was mobility and movement on the battlefield. Uh, they taught Stuart's campaigns, they taught Sherman's campaigns, Sheridan, uh, but nothing about the siege, they call the siege warfare. This led in 1914 to a philosophy which was described as open warfare when the American troops first arrived on the Western Front. There was one telling story where a British officer who had risen from second lieutenant to major and was acting in command of, I think, the Royal Berkshire, one of the battalions of the Royal Berkshire Regiment, addressed a group of American officers rather like this, talked them through what had been going on. An American colonel stood up at the end, thanked him for this fine presentation and said to them, but remember, the British and French have been doing this for four years and it ain't worked yet and it's not going to work. Uh, we'll be using open warfare. Now, what they meant by open warfare was uh, what we see at Petersburg, you get out of the trenches and you charge forward. And being Americans, we are not morally better than the Germans and we will provide. If we can give you some artillery or tanks or machine guns, that's a bonus. But you will do it as infantry on your own. What was it, Polygon Poly Poly Woods or something? The, Sorry, uh, what was that? Where, where Pershing done something in WW1? Either the middle, right up the middle or something, and he got his troops slaughtered? Uh, yeah, yeah, and it's yeah. interesting that when yeah, Pershing Sorry. stepped back to become the Army Group Commander, and um, uh, uh, Hunter Liggett uh, became the first Army Commander, he began wholesale changes of tactics and approaches of artillery and everything else. 